Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. We've done lots of videos on sharpening. It's such an important topic. But this video, we're going to take you behind the scenes and explain the hows and the whys as to what I use and why I recommend it. So if you've been curious about that aspect, stay with us. We're going to give you all the details. I'm Rob Cosman, and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell so you'll receive alerts when we release a new video. And anytime we use a special tool, we'll always leave a description down below. All right, let's get to work. I think it goes without saying, sharpening is the most important skill for a hand tool woodworker. If you think about how many tools whose performance is either enhanced or diminished based on your ability to sharpen, it's pretty impressive. From your go-to hand plane, to a carving chisel, even the cutter on a marking gauge, your regular chisel, a shoulder plane, a scraper blade, a spoke shave, all of these either work very well or very poorly based on your ability to sharpen. And part of that ability to sharpen has got to be the equipment. Really good equipment is going to make it easier, you'll learn faster, and you'll be able to produce that edge you want much quicker. Now, if you have not seen my video on sharpening, we will leave a link below. It's entitled 32 Seconds to Sharp. You can go and check that out and hopefully you'll be able to mimic exactly what I do and produce that kind of an edge that you're looking for. When you first go to look for a sharpening system, you're faced with a lot of decisions. What am I going to get? Now, several years ago, everybody used oil stones. They were natural and then water stones came out. I started using water stones in the mid 80s. They were made by King thought they were great. The big advantage was that they were easy to flatten. About 2000, 2001, I was introduced to Norton's. And Norton was a man-made water stone, and it cut a whole lot faster. But it also went out of flat very quickly. So you have to understand this. They all use some kind of an abrasive particle, usually either aluminum or silicon oxide, held in place by some kind of a bonding agent. So the idea is that these measured particles do the cutting on the steel, but as the bonding agent wears, it keeps giving you a fresh layer of cutting particles. So that is designed to keep the speed of cut up. However, as that bonding agent wears, it goes out of flat. And as far as I'm concerned, a flat stone produces a sharp edge. And if you don't have a flat stone, you're not going to get a serviceable sharp edge. Well, I think the two best options are water stones, and I'll be more specific, ceramic water stones and diamond stones. That's, where you're, that's the decision that you're going to have to make and I'm going to tell you as we go through this how I progress along that process to come to where I am today with what I use. I think it was when water stones became popular that people started to pay attention to the particle size. So you see the numbers on the back. This is 16,000, 6,000, 1,000. This has an 8,000 on there. What, what does the number mean? Well if you took a one inch by one inch screen and you had a thousand holes in it, that's how you would get a measured 1,000 grit particle size. And of course a 16,000, that same one inch square, but there would be 16,000 holes. So that's your particle size. However, you, all, you heard me mention that those particles, those abrasive particles, have to be held in place. A water stone would use what we call a clay matrix. And that matrix is designed to wear, so you keep getting that fresh layer of cutting particles. And because it wears, the stones must be maintained flat. And there's several ways of doing it. You'll find that the more expensive the system, usually the higher the tolerance, the flatter the stone, the better the result. That's just the way it works. As I, as I mentioned, I started off with my father's old oil stone. And it wasn't until I got more serious about this that I realized how out of flat it was and how critical the flattening process or having a flat stone is. If you've ever tried to flatten a natural oil stone, it is a pain. Yeah, put that off on the side. As I mentioned, I started using king stones and I thought they were much better because they were so much easier to flatten. But it wasn't until I was introduced to Norton stones, probably in 2000, 2001, that I realized how slow cutting the king stones were. That bonding agent that, helds, that holds the abrasive particles in place didn't wear quick enough, so the stone had a tendency to gloss over and the speed of cut really slowed down. The Nortons, wow, they cut really fast, 
but they went out of, fa out of flat very fast. I used to tell folks you need to stop and flatten them every 30 to 45 seconds if you want to stay working on a flat surface, otherwise you're going to end up in a dish. Nice thing about the ceramics, they you can probably get a minute out of those. You got to remember, the more frequently you stop and flatten, the less work it is, and the quicker it is, and the better the result will be. But there's something we haven't talked about much, and that is the diamond stones. They don't ever require flattening. They start with a steel plate that is flat, and they adhere an industrial diamond to it. Now, when I got to tell you the story about this. I, uh, when I got really serious about my woodworking in the mid 80s, I'd heard about diamond stones, I bought them, they were incredibly expensive. But I noticed that uh, they cut really fast and a month later, it's almost as if there was no grit there. I didn't find out until many years later that they used to use what was called a polycrystalline diamond. Now they use a monocrystalline diamond. The latter is much more durable and much better suited for sharpening. So you have these measured uh, particles, in this case, 1,000 on that side, 300 on that side. They adhere them to the diamond plate with a, a nickel uh, bonding agent, or what do they call it, the nickel plating. And the only downside to them is that if you allow them to stay wet, they possibly will rust on you. But they never have to be flattened. They're almost indestructible. You can drop them on the floor, nothing's gonna happen. They will eventually wear, but you get a lot of use. And when I say a lot of use, I'm talking fly five to seven years if you're doing this as a hobby. Really a great option. The other downside is you really can't get them much finer than four, 6,000. You're never gonna get the 16,000, which I think is essential for getting that really great final edge. But they are a good, um, a good option for anybody looking to get into hand tool woodworking I was, uh, I was what you would call a professional woodworker up until 2000. And it was that year that I discovered that we were going to starve to death if I didn't find some other way to earn a living. I think we had six children by that time. And there just weren't enough people who knew enough about wood that were willing to pay the money that would uh, buy them a piece of furniture that would last for generations. Well, I started selling Lee Nelson tools. That's when I first was introduced to Norton. I thought the Nortons were great because in addition to selling tools, I started teaching classes. And uh, they worked so well that the students could catch on rather quickly. So in 2006, we had a meeting with Shapton, the Shapton rep. And I really wasn't looking for something better. But uh, I, I heard the pitch. I was quite impressed with what I heard. I bought the kit, took it home. I actually used it that summer at my classes and the students loved it. And I thought, wow, this is really good. We had always gone to 8,000 grit on a water stone. They offered a 16,000, and the difference was quite dramatic. It really made a piece of maple. You could hold it up and literally see a reflection in the raw wood. So let me tell you a little bit about the Shapton, and I'll tell you why I think it's so good. They, it's called the glass stone series. So the white portion, which is a quarter of an inch thick, is the actual abrasive and then they adhere it to a piece of float glass. You don't have to soak them, which was the other downside to water stones. You had to keep them soaking in water or else it would take 20 minutes before they would finally stop uh, having it absorb into the surface. And why you, want water, why you want the surface to be wet, as I mentioned earlier, is it helps to keep the particles suspended so that it's not clogging up the surface of the stone and it also lubricates. With the Shaptons, you only had to spritz them. In fact, they recommend that you don't soak them. The fact that you have your material adhered to a piece of glass, if you were using a solid stone, you'd get down to a certain thickness and it would just not have the stiffness to hold its shape, it cracks, it breaks, and it's all of a sudden, uh, at least a quarter of your stone is no longer any good. In this case, you wear right down to the glass, so you get 100% of the stone to your uh, ability to use. I think the fact that they go up so high is fantastic. It's, I would never give up my 16,000. I just think that is the absolute best stone to finish any cutting edge with. And it doesn't take any longer than going to 8,000. And, and you'll see that on the video that I told you entitled 32 Seconds to Sharp. So big advantage, the selection of grits, the fact that they're attached to a piece of glass so they stay flat and you get to use 100% of the material. You don't have to soak them. They only need to be spritzed. 
And the only downside is because it is so hard, it's going to take a diamond product in order to keep it good and flat. So Shapton has, uh, which is a small company in Japan, has designed everything that you need in a sharpening kit. And for a long time, this is all I used. Now, as I mentioned, they have to be kept flat and because it's a ceramic product, it needs a diamond in order to flatten it. So Shapton makes what's called their lapping plate. And it is a piece of glass with diamond embedded and it's extremely flat. It's probably the flattest um, diamond lapping product on the market but it's also incredibly expensive. If you want the very best system, this is it, but pricey. Well, I was doing a, a wood show over in England, London, England, back in 2010, I think. And uh, one of the fellows that I knew from doing the wood show circuit was there, and he had developed this plate. And he came over at some point during a break and said, Rob, if you get a chance, I'd like to show you something. So I went over to his booth and uh, he had this plate sitting there and he took the piece of carbide off a saw blade and he drew a black line on the stone. And I knew what that was. The black was the actual carbide and I was quite impressed. Wow, you're cutting carbide that easily. He told me a little bit about it. I was impressed enough that I bought it. Well, I want to show you what really turned my crank. If you look at the back of the Shapton uh, lapping plate, you see the grit size and it's stated from 270 to 325. That's the approximate grit size. Well, the trend plate on the back side has a 300 grit surface. Well, that's almost exactly the same as the Shapton. And I got thinking, because we had just encountered a 30% price increase on Shapton, so all of a sudden it got to that point where, wow, this is expensive. Well, what we could do with this trend diamond plate, now you kind of have to look at what a Shapton system at that time looked like. You had two heavy holders, and I'll tell you why they're an integral part later. You had your lapping plate. You had your starting stone, which is typically a 1,000 or 500 grit. And you had your finishing stone, which had to sit on a heavy holder as well. When you would come in to prepare to sharpen, you would take your, trend, your um, diamond lapping plate. You'd flatten your 16,000, rinse it off. You'd flatten your 1,000, rinse it off, and there you'd go. I always kept two heavy holders because the slurry off of the stone would eventually almost weld it on there. And to have to take that off each time, scrape all the crud off to get the other one to sit flat wasn't worth it. So you just had the two. Well, the Trend 1000 grit replaced the 1000 Shapton and the heavy holder. That was a pretty good savings. The 300 grit side replaced the lapping plate. So now you had one stone, which by the way was heavy enough, it didn't need a holder. You had one holder and your 16,000 grit stone. And this was a really big saving. And for most people, this is fantastic. However, if you're really fussy, what you'll notice is the level of flatness on the Trend diamond plate is not as high as it is on the Shapton. Now I try to qualify this by giving you an actual percentage. And I, I, I use the term, or the, the uh, statement, you get about a 5% improvement on the back of a chisel by using the all Shapton system. In fact, using the trend, you can never get the back of your chisel to look as perfect as you can using this. Now, we'll link down below to a video we did on chisel preparation so you can follow that process and you'll see the actual result of using one chisel using this system and using a chisel using the Hall Shapton system. And the, the difference is quite dramatic. But remember, when you actually get to woodworking and you're dealing with just the edge, it's probably only about a 5% difference. So now the heavy holder. And when you look at it, it's, it's quite expensive. But here's why it's so good. It weighs probably five pounds. It's a bunch of float glass encased in rubber. And when you try to, particularly when you're trying to flatten this stone, and I've made all kinds of jigs before I finally succumbed and just bought it. You know, chasing that stone all over the place, it's a pain. The fact that it's held up like this allows you to get in there with your fingers down underneath and run that Trend diamond plate or the Shapton over that and get that thing perfectly flat. So I hate to break it to you, but you're going to want to have that heavy holder. So this is typically what you're going to use. 
Now, I advocate that you start with 16,000, pardon me, 1,000, and you do something called a secondary bevel. This is all covered in the video that we're linking to. But in a nutshell, you create a secondary bevel, whether you're talking a plain blade or a chisel blade. And once you've created that secondary bevel, you go right to your 16,000. And the big secret is the third of the tertiary bevel. By elevating just a degree or two higher, instead of having to go through all those in-between stones, you can go right to that 16 and literally a 32 second procedure. And the evidence is always shown when you actually use it and it works and it's like, wow. Now, the exception to this is when you're initially doing those chisel backs, and again, check that video below, it'll tell you all the information you need. You can't take the big wide surface of the back of a chisel and go from 1000 to 16. Just not going to work. It would be like taking sandpaper from 120 and jumping up to 320. You're going to be there all night. So what we do is we throw in a 6000 grit, which helps get rid of the 1000 grit scratches. And then the 16 gets rid of the 6000 grit scratches. Now, ideally, you'd go even further. You'd go 1,000 to 4,000 to 8,000 to 16. But here's the downside. Once you've done the backs of your chisels, you will never use those in-between stones again. There's no need. So I tell people, I said, if you do a little extra work, you can bypass retiring two stones and just retire one. It's up to you. If you can afford it, it's nice to have the extra steps. If you want to save a bit of money, just throw in the 6,000, do a little more work. But remember, it's a one-time deal in the back of your chisels. When I was using just the Shapton system, it was easy. You use water as a lubricant. You would just spritz the two of them, do your flattening, spritz water on them to lubricate, and away you went. Well, when we introduce the Trend Diamond Plate, the first thing you're going to read in the literature is don't use water on it. Why? Because it may rust. This is supposed to use oil. Well, now you've got oil and water. You're not going to use oil on these stones, and to have to stop and switch, nah, it's not going to work. A friend of mine called me one day, and he said, Rob, i got the solution for you. And he had this product called Honewright, Honewright Golds, made in the U.K. This little bottle uh, makes six liters or a gallon and a half, so it's diluted. It's concentrated, sorry, you dilute it. And what it does, it inhibits water from rusting metal. It's safe to use on your Trend diamond plate and it's safe to use on your Shapton. I wouldn't leave the Trend laying in it overnight, but certainly if the surface was left wet, it will dry without leaving any rust. So it's perfectly safe to use that way. And it's also good around the shop, anywhere you use water. I don't really like water around any metal because it's going to rust it, but I use it in my little container over by the grinder for cooling down the tool when you're sharpening. All right, two things left for you. When it comes to spritzing water, it's nothing more irritating than having a little bit of water left in the container and the, ho the, the, uh, the little hose in there is sticking up on the top side and you can't get anything to get out and it's just a pain. So Jake does a lot of the sharpening in the shop now. And he went to work and he found over in the UK this dip tube that literally just has to touch water anywhere on it. So you can touch water on the side, the end, it doesn't matter because it actually gets it in through the tube, which is absolutely fantastic. He found a good ergonomically nice to use uh, spritz bottle. We call it the world's best spritz bottle, but it gives you a nice fine mist. And you wouldn't think something like that would make a big difference. But you know what? When you're putting the system together, it's nice if all the pieces work well and it just makes the whole process flow so nicely. Now, this is the last part of the puzzle. And remember, I'm trying to give you all the background as to how I found all this stuff and why we put this system together. I recognize that not only do I need to be able to do it, but if I'm teaching this, then my students are going to need to be able to have all access to this so that they can turn around, duplicate exactly what I teach them, and then have the same results in their own shop. Well, I met David Charlesworth back in 2001, 2002, and he had what was called the Charlesworth ruler trick. Now, we cover that in the video, but I just want to give him credit. This is what I consider to be the smartest a bit of uh, information that I ever learned about sharpening, and I've had the opportunity to learn from some of the best. David's ruler trick bypasses the need to polish, flatten and polish the entire back of your blade. 
and instead it concentrates on just a little wee strip that we call a back bevel. Well, again, we used to just use a, a regular um, sharpening rule, or not a sharpening rule, but a, a steel rule that had little uh, marks on it. It was hard to hold in place and it, would, it just wasn't terribly convenient. So Jake went to work and found this rule. It has no serrations on it. It sits there, it tends to stay in place, or you can just hold your finger right there. You leave it on the side, it elevates your blade. Again, watch the video so that you know because if you can internalize this and catch why it works and how it works, it alone will save you a tremendous amount of time in your sharpening and almost guarantee you perfect results every time you do it. It really is the best piece of sharpening information that I have ever learned. Uh, if you like my work, if you like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. And I've always said better tools make it a whole lot easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools, and also talk to you about our online and in-person workshops. Good luck in your woodwork.